I'd like to thank Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Click the link in the description below to get a two month free usage of their website and improve your skills today. Jimi Hendrix is famous for his guitar skills, his stage presence and charisma. Wherever he went, he managed to entertain and impress the audience like no one else. But despite of being the most successful guitarist in the world, he always seemed to deal with a lot of trouble. He was born into a torn apart family, struggled his way into fame, and when he got there, he was scammed by his manager who took away all of his money. He was also a famous black man in America in a time where racial segregation and racism was still going strong. Let's take a closer look at the story of Jimi Hendrix. Hendrix's career was going nowhere until he was introduced to a former animal spacist, Chas Chandler. He became his manager and Hendrix was quick to ask Chandler if he could introduce him to Eric Clapton, whom he had been a big fan of. And since Chandler had a firm contact with Clapton at this point, he brought Hendrix with him to the studio where Clapton's band Cream had one of their recording sessions. Clapton's first impression was that Hendrix was a very shy and soft-spoken guy. There was something about him that beamed with confidence. They jammed together and Clapton was blown away by what he heard. He played um, just about every style you could think of, you know. My life was never the same again, really. But it wasn't just what he heard, he could also see that Hendrix was left-handed but played a right-handed guitar upside down. Now Chandler quickly arranged a band for Hendrix. They ended up with Mitch Mitchell on drums and Noel Redding on bass, and the trio worked fluently together, with Mitch and Hendrix often rampaging with rhythms and melodies, while Redding kept the group grounded with a steady bass. The band was named the Jimi Hendrix Experience, and the one thing that made them unique was how fast they worked. A lot of their songs was made in a very short amount of time, and they only needed one or two takes per song when recording them. On top of that, their music was really hitting home with the rock audience in the UK. Hey Joe, Purple Haze, and The Wind Cries Mary were instant top 10 singles. They went from playing half-filled clubs to playing filled-up clubs, and then clubs with celebrities in them like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. And it all happened really, really fast. In short, Jimi Hendrix was a star that came out of nowhere. So many people, still to this day, are unfamiliar with his background. So let's rewind. Hendrix was born in Seattle in 1942, and he grew up in a predominantly white community. He got his first guitar when he was 12 from his father, and learned to play by listening to rock music on the radio. But he and his brother had a very tough childhood. They went in and out of different orphanages, they were often left alone, and Hendrix had to fend for himself at a very young age. Now, after dropping out of school, some policemen caught him with a stolen car. He was arrested, but didn't end up in jail. His lawyer said that he was going to serve in the military, and so he did. In 1961, he joined the paratroopers, but 14 months and 26 jumps later, he ended his service after breaking his ankle. Now, it was impossible to deny that Jimmy loved playing the guitar by an early age. He stated some of his biggest inspirations as Bob Dylan, Eric Clapton, and Billy Gibbons, amongst others. After he had ended his military service, he and one of his friends formed a band called The King Casuals in Clarksville, Tennessee. Hendrix had watched Butch Snipes play with his teeth in Seattle, so not to be upstaged, Hendrix learned to play with his teeth as well. So he wasn't the one who invented this technique in itself, but he was the one who made it famous. Hendrix's early band made enough money to live off of their music by touring different venues in the south of the US through an affiliation with the Theatre Owners Booking Association. But Hendrix didn't always experience good times with his music. Sometimes he ended up sleeping in the streets, he barely had enough money for food at times, so this guy had nothing to lose. He was either going to make it with his music or not. In January of 1964, after quitting his band and playing with other groups, he was fed up with having to follow the rules of band leaders. He wanted to do his own thing. 
So he moved to Harlem, got a girlfriend with connections in the local music scene there, and this ended up with him winning an award at the Apollo Theater in an amateur contest. After the word about Hendrix started spreading, he eventually got the opportunity to play the guitar in the Isley Brothers backup band, which he would collaborate with on and off during the following years. He also collaborated with the likes of Lil Richard, Rosalie Brooks, King Curtis, and others. So Henrix basically tried to climb the ladder of show business and music, and although he did quite well, he still wasn't fully satisfied. Henrix still struggled to get the recognition that he wanted. But luckily for him, Keith Richards' girlfriend, Linda Keith, happened to notice him playing the guitar during one of his early shows in New York in 1966. She referred him to Chas Chandler, the ex-Animals bassist, and the two quickly developed a working relationship. Fast forward, and we find Henrix playing his first concert in the UK, with Eric Clapton welcoming him to the stage. Eric had played a couple of numbers when he stops and did the most phenomenal introduction for this guy. And out came Jimi Hendrix. And he played the same set he played in New York. But it was just, it was like 10, 10 steps up from what he played before because the crowd was so much bigger. Now, Hendrix had the talent, but he didn't have the crowds and a big enough reputation as a star in England. So his manager, Chandler, therefore asked the famous soul singer, Gino Washington, if Hendrix could go on tour and support his band. And so he did for some time. But Jimmy needed a band of his own. He spent some days testing out different musicians for what was going to be known as the Jimi Hendrix experience. After Mitch Mitchell and Noel Redding was in place, the trio recorded a few tracks that instantly became hit singles, and despite of only having a few songs, they jumped on a plane to France and played concerts there. Because Jimmy had such a futuristic, heavy and hard-hitting sound, he didn't really need that much material. What the band already had made such a strong impression already. Hendrix was also hitting every single note of his guitar like the greatest baseball pitcher would pitch a baseball. He was a musical athlete in many other musicians' eyes. And there's a good reason why he had this extraordinary skill. You know, he used to get up in the morning to go and fry himself a breakfast and he'd be frying bacon and eggs with a guitar on. He'd take the guitar to the loo with him because he, he liked the sound of the echo in there and he'd sit in there sometimes for hours playing the Fender guitar and not plugged in because he liked the sound of coming off the tiles in the loo. He was the best guitarist in the world because he wanted to be the best and he was prepared to work at it. Hendrix was also an incredible live performer, which, again, made up for their lack of material. After all, not a lot of people had seen anyone play their guitar with their teeth, behind their head, or let alone setting it on fire. He was also the first black guitar player to get this kind of recognition from a white audience, and he really managed to play this card well. But it wasn't just the fact that he was black and the way that he played his guitar that made it all stick out. It was also the way he dressed. Now, a lot of people associate this with the typical way that hippies would dress during the 60s, but Jimmy was a pioneer when it came to this style. He was one of those guys who started setting this trend. Now, after touring in Europe, the band went to the US where they gradually played bigger and bigger shows. They eventually became one of the biggest and best live acts of their time, but the thing is that people in the US were harsher than the people in the UK because of their culture still gripping onto racial segregation. The political climate was also hot because of the raging Vietnam War that was going on at this point. In many ways, Hendrix kept himself on safe ground because of his apolitical approach in the medias. Although Hendrix didn't showcase any political interest openly in the medias at this time, he still cared about the rights of black people. He had experienced several racist remarks as he grew up, and because he could relate so deeply to this topic, he actually sent money to Martin Luther King. But things were about to get even darker. After the assassination of King, there were race riots breaking out in New York. This was a tense period in the band's history, since they were expected to play in New York while this was happening. 
If they didn't play, the police said that there would be trouble. But Hendrix was scared out of his mind. Since he was such an icon for love and peace and black people's rights, he could easily be the target of a hitman. Luckily enough, they went to the concert hall, they played the concert, and it all ended well. It actually ended much better than what they expected. The whole audience started crying after they were done playing. By this point, Henrix had experienced all the success he wanted. He wanted to go in a different direction by this point, musically. But the fans wanted something different. They wanted them to play the same old songs over and over. We'd like to stop playing this rubbish and uh, dedicate a song to the... Uh... But another, much bigger problem was also starting to appear. They earned at most about $100,000 per gig, which was an insane amount of money at that time. And fortunately, most of this money never landed in the pockets of the band members. Their manager at this time had taken all of their money and flown to the Bahamas. So on January of 1968, Henrix had less than $20 in his bank account in London, just to put things into context. And just to make things even worse, the lack of money and the repetitive nature of their shows wasn't the only thing that made things go downwards. Because he had set such a high bar for his shows, people expected him to burn his guitar and go nuts every single time he was playing. And he delivered the goods, but on a diet of sex, diet pills, sleeping pills, and loads of drugs. Henrix was burning out fast, which resulted in him having random panic attacks. At his lowest, he even became violent towards the girls that he was hanging out with. According to friends of Henrix's family, when he returned home, he didn't seem happy. He would laugh and he would make jokes, but this was just on the surface. All the drugs, all the expectations from fans, and all the pressure he experienced through the political climate and the gigs they were doing was really burning him out. Henrix famously predicted his own death. At this point, he told people that he was close to, friends and band members, that he was most likely going to return home in a wooden crate. The accounts of Dimi's death vary. The official version is that he was staying with his girlfriend in a hotel and he choked to death after taking an overdose of sleeping pills and alcohol. Others suggest that he was also high on heroin. No matter what happened, he left an incredible legacy. Hendrix made four albums in total. He was even planning to run his own record studio, which was called Electric Lady Studios. But he was a very confused man. He didn't know his own good, and when he achieved the success that he wanted to achieve, it probably put him in a very weird position. When things were supposed to be fantastic in his life, things really started crumbling. It's a very sad story, and it's a very inspirational story to look into. And I really hope that his childlike, humble, and powerful spirit lives on in musicians to come in the future. Hey guys, if you want to create a YouTube channel featuring awesome video essays like on my channel, and if you also want to avoid the hard work and the mistakes that a lot of people make when doing this, then make sure you click the link in the description below and connect with me on Facebook, and I'll teach you how to do this in a very simple and effective way. I just want to warn you that this is for people who actually want to take action and create an awesome YouTube channel and an awesome online community. So if this is not you, then please do not schedule a call. But if it is you, make sure you take the opportunity, okay? I'll see you on the other side.